we in? The camp that says, I have to be right. I have to win the argument because my side is truth and truth must prevail. Or are we in the camp that says, I am willing to allow someone else to win the argument for the sake of peace, just so that the arguments or the debates will stop. Hi, this is Barry Phillips with 10 Minute Torah, day number one, the Torah portion, Vayigash. Let's go to the book of Bereshit, or Genesis chapter 44, and read verse number 18. And Yehuda came near him and said, O oh, my master, please let your servant speak a word in my master's hearing, and do not let your displeasure burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. So as we see, the rest of this chapter then is about Yehuda having this speech that says to Yosef, if you keep Benjamin, you have to keep all of us because we will not go back to our father empty-handed. Uh, we're, we're, we're just not going to leave him here with you. So let's ask also this question then, is Yehuda's speech that comprises the rest of this chapter, is it one of humility that says, our bad, cup was found and Benjamin's sack, we don't know how he got there, but we stand before you and we recognize you have the authority, you have the power to put us into prison, and we're all going to be guilty if one of us is guilty, so we're begging for some mercy here and trying to find some understanding. How do we work this out to where it all go away? Or... We could see that there are veiled threats that are contained in his words. Some rabbinical scholars have the idea or present the scenario that Yehuda doesn't just stand before him as a servant or bowing down to the ground, but rather he approaches him close, speaking into his ear and in hushed tones is basically saying, you think you're going to keep my brother here? You got another thing coming because you're just like Pharaoh. The Pharaoh that kept our grandmother Sarah and was struck with physical disease by the hand of Elohim, you're no different than he is. And if you tried to keep our brother the way that Pharaoh tried to keep our grandmother, he'll strike you down as well. But you're not keeping him. Now, which way was it? We weren't there. We don't know. <laughs> we could we could be in one camp or the other, stand our ground or try to end the debate as quickly as possible. But it's interesting to me that this scenario is being played out as a revelation of the final days. Um, we have the house of Yehuda, who has under great threat of life with martyrdom, with great struggles and pains, kept the integrity of the Torah. We have Torah scrolls preserved for us today because people died for, to protect them and their integrity. The culture, the language, the identity, uh, the history of the Jews has been preserved under enormous pressure. On the other side, we have a completely different story. We have the house of Joseph, lost, swallowed up among the nations, uh, losing their identity altogether, having a heart to follow after Yah being brought into religious domains to draw near to him only among many of us to realize there's more than what this domain or these organizations are offering, I'm looking for the more, and this journey has brought us out into the middle somewhere, not into Judaism, not into Christianity, but somewhere in the middle. And we're, it's like being in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. We are in no man's land, and it's a struggle to try to figure out who we are, our identity as Joseph was hidden to his brothers, our identity is hidden to many, sometimes even to ourselves. Let's look at the characters they themselves. Joseph has been betrayed by his brothers. He has been taken down against his will to a foreign land. 
He has been sold into slavery. He has endured years and years of hardship, of servitude. He's been broken. He's been humiliated. He's been ground down only to be thrust suddenly into a spotlight. And now he has come into his own, but he still bears the scars inwardly, maybe even outwardly of his servitude. Yehuda. Uh, he was the one that had the idea of selling Yosef. Uh, perhaps it was his idea to concoct the, the, let's dip the coat of Yosef in blood and present it to daddy. Um, a scheme, let's use that word. Only to lose face among his brothers to go down and to marry a foreign woman who gave him sons and then died. Two of those sons were so rebellious against Yah that Yah killed them. And then he was upstaged by his daughter-in-law who acted more righteously than he did. Now he's returned to the family, assumed a more humbled approach to leadership, and he's not just trying to forcefully lead, he is bearing the responsibility. Daddy, entrust Benjamin into my hands. I will bring him back to you, is what we heard him say to Yaakov. Yaakov himself, he struggled with Esau, he struggled with Laban, he had to overcome Hamor of Shekin, he has been wounded in his leg and now he walks with a limp, he has lost his son, his first loved son, Yosef, and he's been in a state of depression for some 22 years. None of these scenarios are good, but they describe who we are right now. House of Yosef struggling with identity and trying to find a means to be reconciled, to be included. The house of Yehuda uh, vigorously defending their identity and trying to hold on to Benjamin, which represents the Temple Mount area. Uh, the house of Yaakov comprising everything. It is a depressed state. It's as if we are all being pushed down and prevented from rising up and seeing the fulfillment of all that has been prophesied about us collectively, and that is the arrival of the kingdom. In the book of Acts, we read about this as Kepha, Simon Peter, is speaking in Acts chapter number 3. In verse number 19, he says, Repent, therefore, and turn back for the blotting out of your sins in order that the times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Master, and that he sends Yeshua Messiah pre-appointed for you, whom heaven needs to receive until the time of restoration of all things or all matters, of which Elohim spoke through the mouth of his set-apart prophets since of old. Yeshua, like the face of Yosef, is hidden from us until there is an appointed time that will come. Uh, where he will be revealed and he will bring about that restoration. In the book of Luke, chapter number seven, uh, excuse me, chapter number one, beginning with verse number 76. Concerning Yeshua as a child, it was prophesied, and you, child, shall be called prophet of the Most High, for you should go before the face of Yahweh to prepare his ways. That's from the book of Malachi, chapter three, verse one. This is a reference to Yeshua, the son, or Messiah, the son of Yosef, the one who exhibits Yosef's characteristics. He goes to reveal the face of the Father, continuing to give knowledge of deliverance to his people for, by the forgiveness of their sins through the tender compassion of Elohim, with which the daybreak from on high has looked upon us again, that's the redeeming quality of Yeshua as the Messiah ben Yosef. Then we see the opposite, uh, the continuing, the Messiah ben David, the son of David. In verse 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That's from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, which speaks of the kingly identity of Yeshua. We have to recognize him as representing both houses, Messiah, son of Yosef, Messiah, son of David, which comes from the house of Yehuda, and he comes to bring us both together to resolve both of our arguments, 
and bring us back together and restore us as a family. We'll build on this tomorrow. To then, shalom.